Okay, so good morning everyone and thank you very much for joining us for this short webinar. Thank you for being here, of course, and we hope you'll find this very useful. What we'll do is we'll try and keep this presentation relatively short in order to allow you time to ask some questions at the end. Um, this is going to be a relatively short format webinar. We know that you're all busy. We don't want to take up too much of your time, but yes, we're there for this. So moving on to the second slide. Um, the contents of this webinar can be summarized as the answers to three questions. Why do we engage at WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, what we are doing, and what you can do to help us? So do note now, there may be some homework for you at the end of this. Going to the next slide. And looking for so why we engage, it makes us go back to the Berne Convention, 1886. Uh, a, sorry, signed in 1886, it's been updated from time to time, but builds on a core differentiation between rights, not only for authors, but for a number of others, uh, which are obligatory for all, and then exceptions and limitations, which are defined nationally for the most part. Rights cover activities such as reproduction, distribution, translation, recitation, and communication to the public for a minimum of life plus 50 years, at least for primary rights holders. In some cases, such as photographs, sound recordings, or anonymous works, terms may be shorter. Other related rights are available for different in the production chain, such as performers. Exceptions and limitations are optional, except for quotations and news of the day, and even then must, most of the time, comply with the three-step test, that they concern a certain specific use of a work, that they do not conflict with the normal exploitation of a work, and that they do not unreasonably prejudice the interests of the right holder. Fortunately, many countries have moved to legislate for exceptions and limitations, although we are a long way from a complete set in countries. The result, therefore, is a very strong unevenness. This image, taken from copyrightexceptions.eu, looks only at Europe, showing quite how patchy uptake of different copyright exceptions and limitations really is. This is also only half of the picture, given that even when two countries have provisions in a particular area, for example, giving access to people with disabilities, they may be implemented or interpreted differently. And of course, at the level of individual digital works, the contracts signed for access add a further level of complexity, given that they may contain, contain different terms, different rules and different limitations. The first implication, therefore, is that students, researchers, users and creators in one country may not enjoy the same possibilities as those in another. Contrary to the very lazy claim that more protection is linked to greater prosperity, the example of the US, as well as the evidence produced by the Australian Productivity Commission recently, suggests that excessive protection is harmful and that exceptions promote both economic and social welfare. The second implication is that when libraries are looking to work across borders, for example, to acquire works, to undertake preservation projects, or to supply documents, they can face a completely different copyright environment from one state to the next. That's around 17,000 potentially different combinations of copyright rules that libraries risk being forced to cope with in order to carry out public interest activities. This is becoming more of a problem as, thanks to technological progress and the obvious benefits, libraries look to carry out more information at international activities. Too often, requests for materials through document supply fall down because of uncertainty or potential infringement, or preservation projects cannot go ahead. A second emerging challenge is around digital. The move from buying physical works to licensing access to digital ones effectively privatizes much of the operation of copyright. Clearly, the move to licensing is a fact of life, and libraries can and should do their best to use these effectively. However, licenses are far from suitable in all cases, and as can be seen in our infographic, which is also available on our website, 
licensing contracts can override the possibility to archive works, to loan them to other libraries, even on a non-commercial basis for private study, or to block data mining. Indeed, where there is no rule to say that such contract terms are non-enforceable, legislation itself risks becoming irrelevant. As a result, an already imperfect copyright system risks becoming even more out of date, faced with the dual trends of internationalization and digitization. For libraries, WIPO has the potential to be part of the solution. WIPO itself is a specialized UN agency based in Geneva, Switzerland, and has 191 member states. The only formally recognized states which are not members are a small number of Pacific Islands and South Sudan. As the name suggests, it covers the range of IP issues, copyright, patents, trademarks, design rights, geographical indications, and traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expression. It serves as guardian of existing treaties, notably around patents and trademarks, where it registers applications. These are also a very powerful source of income for the organization, which is one of the richest in the UN system. There are also standing committees, which commission reports, discuss best practice, research trends, and potentially negotiate new treaties. A recent example has been the Marrakesh Treaty, which provides access to books for people who are blind or have visual impairments or other print disabilities. WIPO does not necessarily move quickly. It took some years for Marrakesh to pick up the necessary momentum to become law, although following its signature in 2013, it came into effect faster than any other WIPO copyright treaty in the last 40 years. WIPO also has a strong behind-the-scenes training program aimed at supporting the ratification of its own treaties and developing infrastructure for IP management. This includes, it seems, developing collective management organisations in different countries. If there is a solution to the challenges faced by libraries, it will be in the, specific, in the Special Committee for Copyright, the Standing Committee on Copyright and Related Rights, or SCCR for short. Like the other committees, this Commission studies, discusses findings and best practices, and explores what can be done to correct problems identified. Its next meeting will be on 13th to 17th November in Geneva. SCCR launched work in the mid-2000s, looking at exceptions and limitations to copyright, which could favour access to knowledge around the world. This work rapidly fell into a number of categories. Exceptions for libraries and archives, for people with print disabilities, which led to Marrakesh, for education and research institutions, and for people with other disabilities. In the case of libraries, we have been lucky to benefit from two exhaustive studies and an update from Professor Kenneth Cruz, looking at exceptions and limitations for libraries and archives in national law around the world. We will receive a third edition this month. This work so far has underlined how far many countries are from a full set of the exceptions that allow libraries to function, as well as how little even new legislation has looked to take account of the digital world. In doing so, the reports have provided a powerful argument for the need for more effective measures to accelerate progress. The study has not focused specifically on cross-border uses, but on the huge diversity of provisions, but the huge diversity of provisions underlines how complicated this is. In its discussions, IFLA has been strong and consistent in calling for meaningful steps which will address the challenge of the growing inadequacy of the copyright system. In this, we have been supported by a number of major regional groups, Africa, Latin America and the Caribbean, and Asia Pacific, which have underlined their support for an international treaty or legal instrument in this area. As a means of organising discussions, the previous chair, Mr Martin Moscoso of Peru, structured discussions according to a chair table or chart covering 11 topics, preservation, reproduction, lending, legal deposit, parallel importation, or can you buy a book from another country even if it is available locally, cross-border activities, orphan and out-of-commerce works, limitations on liability, contract override, technical 
technical protection measures and translation of works. Drawing on examples offered by partner organisations has made the case for exceptions or other relevant steps in these areas, finding considerable support from among the member states. We reached the end of discussions on the Chair's chart at the end of 2016, and in 2017, members of the committee agreed to give the resulting table a semi-formal status, meaning that it could be the basis for ongoing discussions. Clearly, the table isn't perfect and the result needs more work, but this is useful progress. Overall, we continue to make the same arguments as previously, that we need effective steps to help those countries which do not have the right laws in, in place to make progress. We also need exceptions to work across borders. We need practical support to member states in implementing exceptions. Given that exceptions are as much part of copyright as rights themselves, WIPO should be providing as much tailored support as they do to the drafting of laws that create rights. And we need to make sure that the evidence collected and produced can be presented in a way that is most useful to researchers and others. Clearly, there is some opposition to our asks. Right holders and collecting societies among NGOs and the EU and some developed countries among member states say that they do not want anything other than soft law. In practice, they have also blocked any progress in any direction. They use a number of arguments. Firstly, they claim that there is no need for action at WIPO, as all member states have the freedom to introduce exceptions and limitations to copyright. While this may be technically true, the fact that progress has been so slow underlines that international action is necessary. For cross-border uses, it is almost impossible without international coordination. The rapid adoption of legislation to support access to books for people with print disabilities following the Marrakesh Treaty shows what action in Geneva can actually do. Moreover, the same countries and actors, for the most part, make exactly the same argument as we do to justify progress on resale rights or broadcasting. Indeed, in those countries which tend to want to avoid new legislation, notably the US, any steps taken at WIPO to implement exceptions and limitations for libraries are unlikely to lead to any major need for reform. Secondly, they claim that thanks to licensing, there is no need for measures on cross-border access. While licensing may work in many cases, this argument is incorrect, given not only the large share of materials for which no license is available, given that not all rights holders are, but also the clear market failures that still exist. Just because licensing works in one situation, it does not mean it works in all. Thirdly, there's a less openly voiced concern about countries implementing excessively broad exceptions and limitations. They argue that this would risk unfairly taking away revenues from authors and other rights holders with no chance for appeal. This is also not only incorrect, since the TRIPS agreement, the World Trade Organization has the competence to judge cases concerning limitations and exceptions to copyright, but it also misses the point. The challenge today is that inadequate exceptions and limitations are either leaving people without access or leading them to use unauthorized sites to access work they need, works they need, but are not available to them through legal channels. This is exactly the opposite of the concern we are expressing. Finally, there is the argument that at a time where rights holders are looking to adopt, adapt to a digital age, they do not need more disruption. This argument not only assumes that it is acceptable to put education, innovation and development on hold while we look for new business models, but also overstates what we are asking for. Libraries are responsible institutions, staffed by professionals. They are not commercial actors and have no motivation other than to serve their public. Ensuring effective exceptions and limitations will not stop will, will not mean that libraries stop buying original materials, and by law they cannot lead to any unreasonable prejudice to the interests of rights holders. So what can you do for us? You can help us make progress. It is important that libraries hear from their governments hear from their libraries and understand that this work is a priority. 
if they hear nothing, they may not feel the need to speak or may even oppose effective steps forward under pressure from right holders. You can help us build stronger arguments by sharing stories about the challenges you face, both in your work at home and across borders. Do you know researchers who have not been able to access works they need? Preservation projects which have not been able to go ahead? Unnecessary restrictions and costs placed on your work? Let us know. And of course, follow us during the next meeting on 13th to the 17th of November and help us show the governments at WIPO how much support there is for what we are doing. So that's the end of the presentation. Don't hesitate to ask us any further questions. We will of course put this presentation up on the internet as well as the words, the notes that we have used for talking. Now, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to use the group chat and we can answer them as quickly as possible. Thank you. So I'm just going through the list that's already there. So definitely welcome to everyone on there. So there's a question from Teresa about the limits of licensing graphic. This is something that we actually published around the World Library and Information Congress. So this is up on the IFLA website. I'm sure Ariadna who's been following this will be able to put the link up there for everyone. That's good, perfect. So Ariadne has already shared this. So there's a question from Nick Paul about the possibility of achieving a library sector exception at WIPO on the same scale as Marrakesh. I think there's, I think it's important to underline and I'm sure I know we do have a list of who's listening in on this. Um, we are keen to ensure that we do not explicitly link Marrakesh and WIPO too much as one of the arguments we heard frequently in preparing Marrakesh was that it would be the start of and this is this is a it's definitely a sort of it's it's it, 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 um yes this is a this is very much a saying this is very much a, an idiosyncrasy of the language it is a, there was a complaint that Marrakesh would risk being the start of a slippery slope. So the minute that we started giving rights, then people would start adding things to them and trying to expand it. And then all of copyright would disappear and we'd be starting to create a very broad exception. So we are quite clear that we're not asking for rights for libraries just because people with visual impairments and print disabilities could benefit from them. I think also the function the objects of the treaties are quite different. Marrakesh is aimed at a certain group of people. Libraries with a certain group of institutions, so it is different in that sense, although of course it is helpful arguably that Marrakesh created the concept of authorised entities, so special entities which are able to carry out certain activities and make use of certain exceptions to copyright in a way that others simply can't. Clearly for us, a broad exception is the thing that's most useful. I think if we have something that's too specific, then the use is less, the use is less significant. Also, we believe that we need something that covers some pretty basic underlying principles like the possibility to override contract terms. So to make contract terms which prevent the enjoyment of, which prevent the enjoyment of exceptions and limitations unenforceable. So I think we are looking for something broad um, we are looking for something that provides the maximum opportunity to our sector to actually move things forward. We're not linking it so explicitly to Marrakesh though. Thank you, I'm glad that was useful. So yes, there's a question from Harold. Yes, thank you, thanks Elliot, for pointing that. Um, so yes, we the, the problems of cross-border document delivery are 
I think it is the single simplest explanation of where there are where there are specific and it, it, it's the best single source of case studies that we have um, it is again we have to underline that and of course we're not asking for commercial document delivery to be subject to an exception that would clearly fall foul of the the three-step test however it is the area where libraries by working together can make a really significant contribution to knowledge exchange across borders and it's also the one where we where we are aware that so many requests are not fulfilled the example of the uk with the end of the privileged document supply service from the UK, from the British Library, has been a particularly powerful one where, thanks to some of the work that Theresa, who I think is on this call, has, has, has undertaken, we are aware that not only when they replaced an exception-based service with a license-based service, the number of materials on offer, offer for fell dramatically. We think that to a large extent that is because they couldn't find the right holds. They couldn't find a license or for works. The costs went up significantly, given that a payment now had to be paid to right holders, and the demand therefore fell hugely. And as Teresa's research has helped point it out, this has not just hurt libraries, but it's also hurt hospitals and other places which rely on this ability to access knowledge across borders. Clearly, explaining document supply to people is sometimes it's not the easiest ask in the world, but this is where your examples come in. If you can provide concrete examples of how people wanted to do something, wanted to research a point or find out about something using document supply and weren't able to, and this prevented their research or even stopped them doing their jobs, then this is actually something really valuable for us. And so we really welcome anything you can add on this point. And as Teresa said in the comment box, there's a there's a great resource from Eiffel on what document supply is and the Im Im issues there. So further examples will be good. Are there any further questions? So Within countries, thanks Nick for the extra question, clearly there are different ways of doing exceptions and limitations. There is the, what tends to be the European continental model includes very explicit exceptions and limitations, saying what is possible and what isn't possible. In that sense, there are some countries in the EU in particular who simply took the list of possible exceptions set out in European legislation back in back in 2001 and simply just copied pasted and said yes we're going to do absolutely everything so countries like Estonia and Finland tend to be very good at actually doing that and unsurprisingly these are also highly literate highly educated and highly innovative economies elsewhere clearly there's the, the fair dealing exception which is what is often seen in British inspired or countries that clearly used to be under the influence of, of, of the UK these also work, although simply there the question is that you have a an exception which says that uses that are fair, this is the fair dealing provision, uses that are fair in the field of education can be accepted. These also seem to work, although and we've seen recently in countries like Australia and South Africa, which have fair dealing provisions, recent reviews have shown that they don't go quite far enough and there's been a big push for something more flexible. The, it's not the job of IFLA to say that a particular copyright regime is the right one because given different legal systems things work differently. Certainly the fair use exception in the US which covers not only the individual areas explicitly but gives a broad principle that as long as the use of a work is fair it should not be subject to copyright. It should be able to benefit from an exception. Um, that seems to work relatively well and of course has the benefit of not being immediately out of date once a different use or a different technology comes into place. So it seems that broad fair use provisions do seem to benefit. Clearly it does rely on, lit it does rely on litigation, it does rely on the courts, so there's a, an element of the judges deciding the bounds of what's possible and what isn't. But 
it's still something that certainly we've seen big pushes for in Australia and South Africa. Certainly the library community in both of these countries has been very strong in calling for this. Clearly, we're not going to get a fair use exception for everyone at WIPO. Legal traditions are too different and there's likely to be too much trouble with them. Um, likely to be far too much trouble with, with compliance with the three-step test, at least in the minds of some. That's why we are aiming very much for to set out this basic minimum of exceptions and limitations that everyone should be having, both for the interests of education, innovation and creativity internally, but also in order to ensure that there is enough similarity between regimes between countries in order to make cross-border work possible. So if there are no more questions, um, and I'll keep an eye on the chat in case someone does have something else, what we'll do is we will put the download of this presentation on the event page where this, this event is mentioned on our website. We will also put the, the speaking notes so you can read what we've been talking about and also the PowerPoint in case you want to have another look at that yourself. Of course, everything we do is done in Creative Commons, so if you want to try and explain what IFLA is doing to members of your association or to people who simply haven't been able to join, please do encourage them to download the material, give your own presentations, and obviously there's, there's, there's IFLA mentions who are attributed, but yeah, do take advantage of all this. Thank you very much. Excellent. Have a good day, everybody.